Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Andrew Natsio, the director of the Scowcroft Institute of International Affairs. And on behalf of Ryan Crocker, our dean, I'd like to welcome you all to this conference. We call it the Scowcroft Legacy Conference. And I'd like to read a, a letter to you as I begin, uh, as we begin the conference. I send warm greetings to all who are attending this conference. I know some have traveled far to speak today, and I am most grateful. Some of the speakers include scholars, practitioners, and friends I have known for many years. As I unfortunately cannot be with you, I trust you will take the opportunity to tell the truth about me, warts and all. In any case, it would be awkward for me to be at the conference focused on my life's work in American, the American foreign policy arena. Ryan Crocker and Andrew Natsios told me they were going ahead with this conference even if I was reluctant. I hope the conference will provide insights on the role of the National Security Advisor in the formulation of U.S. policy, on the national security policy process itself, and on proposals for its reform. We seem to be in a particularly turbulent period in international politics and economic affairs. As a consequence, questions have been raised about the relevance of the post-World War II and post-Cold War institutions and policies that have been the cornerstone of transatlantic community for decades. Given the indispensable role of the United States, a role I believe must and will endure, national security process led by the President's National Security Advisor will have to formulate a broad U.S. strategy to preserve what is best and reform must, what must be modernized. Whether the international system will evolve incrementally and peacefully toward a new equilibrium or whether stresses will weaken the existing system and thus American national security objectives may be the most important question of the day. Reforms to the national security process might better prepare the president and national security apparatus to re respond to these challenges. So again, thank you for coming to discuss this important topic. I very much look forward to hearing the results of the discussion. Best wishes, Brent Scowcroft. Uh, we are going to record this, uh, videotape it, and we will put it on the website and uh, General Scowcroft has asked specifically for the link so that he can watch the entire uh, day's uh, presentations himself from Washington. We are honored, however, to have the President and Mrs. Bush with us this morning. Um, not quite a substitute for Brent Scowcroft, but certainly <laughs> a, <laughs> a, good, a great substitute. I might add that uh, I served President Bush at, at the bottom of the bureaucracy uh, 30 years ago as the director of the Office of Foreign Disaster Assistance, and we were in those days responding to famines and civil wars that were breaking out all over the world as the uh, Cold War order collapsed. And we had a huge increase in what we call complex humanitarian emergencies. These were failed states, essentially. And we used to track them, and our budget quadrupled in a matter of three years. And we sent so many teams out to respond to the emergencies there was no one left in the office. And the staff said, you, you can't send another team out, Andrew. There's only the secretary left. Uh, everyone else is out in the field. And uh, I know President Bush used to track us where we were because he would make comments to Andy Card and Paul Salucci, my good friend, as to where our teams were in the world. So I realized we had a, a, someone in the, in, the, in the Oval Office who was watching what we were doing, which we appreciated. So we were seeing this from the bottom up rather than from the top down. And it was fascinating for me as an operator, as a manager, uh, a crisis manager, to watch the uh, evolution of or collapse of the old order and the creation of a new order. One of the things the career, office, career officers and aide told me, foreign service officers and civil servants, was that during the four years of the Bush presidency, uh, they were always sure that a steady hand was at the helm that all decisions that were being made were made carefully and prudently and thoughtfully with the President and Jim Baker and, of course, Brent Scowcroft. And I think historians are now looking back saying this is a model for crisis management. And it was one crisis after another. It wasn't just one, one event. So it's, it's my pleasure to uh, welcome you this morning myself. And uh, what we're going to do, we hope, is when we get the tape, to transcribe it, we may publish a paper or a book or a, 
report on what happened at the conference for the historical record, because these conferences always produce things that are not quite in the uh, existing record as we know it, and I think we can make a contribution. So thank you all for coming. I'd like to thank the, uh, both scholars and practitioners uh, for attending today. And I'd, I'd like to introduce my, my good friend, Dean Ryan Crocker, who will speak next, one of the great diplomats of our generation. Thank you. Ryan? Um, thank you, Andrew, and uh, welcome to you all. Uh, Mr. President, Mrs. Bush, we're very honored to have you here today for um, a Brent Scowcroft Legacy Conference. Um, uh, Andrew is a very good negotiator, uh, has been through his entire career. I think his finest moment may have uh, come when he actually convinced um, Brent Scowcroft uh, not only to authorize this conference, um, but he also planned to attend. Uh, circumstances uh, uh, were otherwise, uh, uh, unfortunately, but um, uh, we, 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 we actually got, or Andrew got, Brent Scowcroft uh, to allow his name to be paired with the word legacy. Uh, we're, we're now working on you, Mr. President. It's a <laughs> uh, uh, we have an extraordinary day ahead with the very finest practitioners and the very finest scholars. Um, I'm particularly pleased that uh, uh, my former colleague Steve Hadley is here. You'll uh, you'll be hearing from him next. Uh, uh, during some um, pretty crunchy times when I was ambassador to Iraq, uh, I had a lot of uh, occasion to reflect on the role of a uh, truly great national security advisor. Um, uh, and that was, uh, that was Steve Hadley. I think very much in the Brent Scowcroft model of the quiet man. Um, Mr. President, uh, reflecting back on those times, and like Andrew, I was also um, a, a very small part of your administration uh, as ambassador to Lebanon. Um, and I, I can imagine the, the, the embassy had been closed in Beirut uh, for a year and a half. Uh, because of security threats. Uh, uh, I was chosen to go out and reopen it. And I've often imagined the conversation um, that, that must have taken place in, in the White House. And I, I can imagine you, sir. I can imagine um, Secretary Baker, General Scowcroft, saying, well, the world is changing, the Middle East is changing, we need to be back in the game everywhere, including in Beirut, but it's really, really crunchy there. Um, and somebody said, I know, we can send Crocker. Uh, it, if it works, great. And if it doesn't work, no great loss. <laughs> it, it's the doctrine of expendability. It's a, uh, Mr. President, I think we all know that in the finest national security team uh, ever assembled, that you and Brent Scowcroft had a special and unique relationship. As, as has been said, the two of you were unbelievable partners. Uh, he had your complete trust. And that is so critical, as we will hear in the course of the day, uh, for a successful national security advisor. Here's what you wrote in your diary uh, the night that Kuwait was liberated, February 28, 1991. Brent Scowcroft takes the burden off of the president 
tasks the bureaucracy, sorts out the differences, and never with credit for himself. He's always quiet, but always there and always dependable. Words written 25 years ago that frame our conversations today. But Mr. President, this, this conference is not only about Brent Scowcroft, it's, it's about you. Uh, uh, you were the president that formed this incredible national security team. We are a presidential system, ultimately it is always about the president. Um, here's what you wrote at the end of A World Transformed. The importance of presidential leadership is probably greater now than ever. From a domestic perspective, the president must take seriously his constitutional role as the chief foreign policy maker, developing objectives and setting priorities, doing what is right for all, even if it is unpopular, and then rallying the country. The challenge of presidential leadership in foreign affairs is not to listen to consensus, but to forge it at home and abroad. Nowhere is this leadership more critical than in creating a new domestic consensus for the American role in the world. There should be no question that we must face future challenges head on without reverting to the isolationism and protectionism of the earlier part of the century. Our nation can no longer afford to retire selfishly behind its borders as soon as international conditions seem to recede from crisis to be brought out again only by the onrush of the next great upheaval. This was a pattern I was determined to break as we moved beyond the Cold War, and it is one we must continue to put behind us. Mr. President, those, those words were the philosophy of your presidency. They were absolutely true when you wrote them in 1998, but never more true than they are today. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me now introduce um, our next, our first speaker, beyond Ryan. And uh, is, uh, of course, Steve Hadley, my colleague and friend, who was the Deputy National Security Advisor in the first uh, uh, Bush, the, the W administration, but the first of the two, year, two terms in office, and then he was the National Security Advisor in the second. I have to say, and I, I sometimes lose my temper, and I get, I remember him raising his eyebrows sometimes when I would raise my voice in NSC meetings. Steve only lost his temper once in the six and a half years, and actually I was really glad he did because someone was annoying both of us in the room. But he always was a steady hand, always tried to get all of the different points of view out. In my view, he is a younger version of Brent Scowcroft, and it was an honor to serve with him both when I was at AID and then I was President Bush's envoy to Sudan. Uh, and in both positions, he played a central role and I always, all of us at AID regarded him as someone who understood what we did and understood the, the role of development. And then at Sudan, he was um, uh, critically important to us fashioning a strategy for dealing with the Bashir government and the crisis in, Sudan, in Darfur and then in South Sudan. So uh, one of our senior foreign policy leaders in the Republican Party, my good friend Steve Hadley.
Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. It's particularly a pleasure to see President and Mrs. Bush and see you looking so well. It's great that you took the time to be here. Um, and it's in a great cause, of course, because it's a salute to Brent Scowcroft, someone that you both love and respect uh, as much as I and the rest of us do. So thank you so much for being here. Uh, my, my topic this morning is the role <clears throat> and the importance of the National Security Advisor. And it's really impossible to talk about that subject without talking about Brent Scowcroft. Many people would say that Henry Kissinger is the father of the interagency system that we have today. He was the one that came up with this notion of a network of committees at various levels of the government, bringing together various agencies interested in issue and trying to shape the issue and shape options to send them up to the president for decision. And that, what we call the interagency system, was really Henry Kissinger's creation, and it's the system with which we're still dealing with today, largely unchanged. But it is Brent Scowcroft who is the father of the modern-day National Security Advisor. Interestingly, the National Security Act of 1947, which established the National Security Council, makes no mention of the National Security Advisor. It was a position that only began to emerge over time, probably emerging first in its current forms um, under uh, President Kennedy and under the auspices of McGeorge Bundy. It took greater prominence under President Nixon when Henry Kissinger held the office and under President Carter when Spigniew Brzezinski held the office. But it is Brent that established the model or the base case for the role of the National Security Advisor and how to perform it. Many of you probably have met, have read David Rothkoff, who is in some sense uh, the, the, the resident scholar, if you will, on the National Security Advisor and the NSC system. He has looked and evaluated National Security Advisors really from the beginning and has concluded that the Scowcroft model is the model that has best performed for the president and best perform for the country over time. And that is certainly right. And most of us who have followed Brent in that role have tried to follow his model for carrying out that office as best we could. Brent was also instrumental in preser preserving the national security system and the national security advisor role in its current form. Uh, and people, I think, have forgotten this history. It takes us back to the Reagan administration when it was disclosed in 1985 and 1986 that the Reagan administration had sold arms to Iran in order to try to convince Iran to use its influence with Hezbollah to release American hostages held by Hezbollah in Lebanon. And in doing so, it violated an established national policy of not ransoming hostages by paying terrorists. And the funds from that sale were then diverted to fund the arming of the Contras, rebel forces in Nicaragua, uh, a funding that was in violation of congressional prohibition. So at that point, it seemed that everything about the national security system had somehow failed in those circumstances, and the question was, how did that happen? There was a huge public outcry, and there were calls for the Congress to amend the National Security Act of 1947 to essentially take over the NSC system, and in particular, to require that the National Security Advisor be confirmed by the Senate and be compelled to give public testimony before the Congress. If those initiatives had succeeded, it would have destroyed the utility of the National Security Advisor to the President. It is a, the National Security Advisor is a position of trust and confidence, and the National Security Advisor will not be able to speak confidentially with the President, and the President will not be able to invest that trust and confidence in the National Security Advisor if the President has to worry that some congressional committee will pull the National Security Advisor up and interrogate the National Security Advisor and what he told the President of the United States. 
that making the National Security Advisor Senate confirmed and responsible to testify for the Congress would basically convert the National Security Council staff and the National Security Advisor to just another agency of government. And the President would have to look elsewhere for an informal arrangement of someone in whom he could impose confidence and confidentiality at the same time. It would have violated the separation of powers because the National Security Advisor and the National Security Staff is the tool that the President relies on to exercise the President's independent role under the Constitution in foreign policy and national security. It would have, in some sense, made it impossible for the President to do their job. So in the wake of the public outcry, President Reagan established the Tower Commission, three members, former Senators John Tower and Ed Muskie, and then, of course, Brent Scowcroft. They were charged with looking into what went wrong uh, and how, why the national security system could produce this kind of policy. What were the failures in the process? What were the failures in the institution? And what needed to be done to re remedy them? Brent was the driving force in that effort, and he used the commission report to fend off efforts by Congress to revise the national security system, uh, and particularly fended off efforts to prevent the national security advisor from becoming a creature of the Congress rather than a servant of the president. Brent uh, mustered the arguments, advanced the case, won the argument, and the Congress backed off. He personally wrote the section of the report that describes the proper role of the National Security Advisor. I was the drafter of the, of the Tower Commission report, and Brent put me through, I must have been 20 to 25 drafts of that section in particular until he got it just the way he wanted it. And I would say to you that it is still today the best statement and the best description of the role of the National Security Advisor and how it needs to be carried out in order to best serve the country and best serve the President. So that's why it's impossible to talk about the National Security Advisor without talking about Brent Scowcroft. He served in the role as National Security Advisor to President Ford from 1975 to 77. He preserved the role and position of the National Security Advisor in its current Formed during the Tower Commission of 1986 and 87. He wrote the definitive description of that position and how it should be performed. And then, of course, he served the second time brilliantly under President George H.W. Bush from 1989 to 1993. And he has become the model for all those who have followed him in that position. The National Security Advisor, I think, is the best job in government. You spend more time with the president than any other member of the president's national security team. You're the first to see him in the morning, and it's usually quite early. And you're the last to see the president before the president makes a major decision. You are also the person in the national security apparatus most likely to know the president's mind on any foreign policy and national security issue. It means you're involved in almost every major national security issue that matters across the globe. If you like substance of foreign policy, this is the job for you, because it is probably the least ceremonial and has the least ceremonial